cult following movies the like the one of the one of the silent night deadly night movies yes which was crazy (laughs) (laughs) you know what's funny about that is um when the first original movie came out um i was not in california yet yet i wasn't acting and i remember thinking to myself i i didn't care to I was just in a weird way, I guess because of the whole Santa Christmas (laughs) murder thing. I was like, I don't know if I want to be in that. I don't know if I want to be in that kind of movie. And then, (laughs) and what's the first movie role I get? (laughs) Silent Night, Deadly Night Part 2. But of course I took it. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, And it was strange because uh, like you said, it does have a cult following. And then it was re-released on on Blu-ray a couple of years ago. And uh, had some interesting interviews through that as well and got to be a part of, of that and met the lead actor again after all these years. So that was very interesting. You never know where it's gonna, where it's gonna go. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't find any info about these movies, but I know you had leading roles and stuff like Lifetime Contract and- well, Yeah, Lifetime Contract was, was more of a faith-based type film. Oh. So it was like an hour. So I think they showed it like at Christian events and youth groups and things like that. Oh, okay. And um, what was your experience being in Fatal Beauty? Be- being in? Fatal Beauty. Oh, you know, that was um, interesting because um, basically, I mean, I my only gig in that was to be, be this dead kid. Yeah, and you know Who- Whoopi Goldberg uh, starred in it, and mm-hmm. Sam Elliott, and um, what they did was uh, these kids die from this drug, right? So it's Fatal Beauty is the name of this drug that's like an epidemic, and these kids are having a party, so they all take this thing called Fatal Beauty or something, but that's the drug, and uh, so you see me on screen only for maybe three, four seconds with my, you know, close up when I'm dead. But Whoopi Goldberg, uh, when I was walking out, she looked at me and she said, y'all sure make good dead kids. So I'll take take that as a praise. Did you get to meet Sam at all either? No, I I, I only met Whoopi Goldberg, but Sam Elliott was, uh, uh, they they had his double, which was interesting because the guy looked just, yeah. (laughs) So it was kind of weird. It's like, oh, is that Sam Elliott? Then no, that's not. That's a guy who kind of looks like him. Mm -hmm. That was kind of interesting. And another. My dog just. <laughs> and I know another cult movie that you were in the same year was uh, *Deadly Prey*. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, kind of interesting too. Um, I'm I'm just one of these soldiers in this thing, and I, I get slammed up against a tree, and my my back gets broken. No. Oh. <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> and. There's stuff like uh, murder and law and street soldiers. Yeah, yeah, those were, those were again. You know, I was doing all these little B movies, which was crazy. Um, murder and law was about this um, crazy mother-in-law that escapes a mental institution and comes back to her son's family. Mm-hmm. And so I'm the, I'm the kid in that family, and um, you know, of course, they don't know she's murdered people to get out. And um, uh, the, f- the guy who played my father was Joe Estevez, who's done a lot of sort of B-movie type things, but he's uh, Martin Sheen's brother. Yep. Which is, mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and he's, he was such a great guy to work with. It was a lot of fun, you know, to do that movie. Um, so, you know, and, and I, I love doing those because it was such a great way to learn to be an actor on film. Right. You know, getting all these, all these types of movies to begin with. Oh, and then the um, the crazy one I did was uh, um, that Lauderdale, which was also called Spring Fever USA. But that was um, sort of the first one, one where I had like a, the lead, major lead. Mm-hmm. And um, I had gone in, I auditioned, and they had already hired the lead actor, actually, and the lead actress. And then when I went in, they still called me in for whatever reason. Um, they called me back. I know they told me that day they wanted me. It was so weird. <laughs> and, and because there was another actress that they kind of liked, but 
just she and I worked together, you know? Right. At, where I guess the other actor and her, you know. So anyway, it was weird. And then the next week they were like, okay, can you start filming next week? And we're going to start driving all the way to Fort Lauderdale from LA. And we're going to film along the way. Oh, yeah. So we're all in this, this caravan of motorhomes and equipment, just leaving Los Angeles and filming, you know, crazy things along the way. And we ended up filming all over, um, we filmed in Texas, we filmed in Florida. Um, I think they filmed a little bit in New Orleans area. But um, that was amazing. That was actually a lot of fun to do. Mm. It's on YouTube and it's free. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and i've seen you i saw you post the screenshot on your facebook page a while ago when you were on saved by the bell um what was oh, your you, you, oh. i'm sorry you froze again. what was the question oh i i saw a while ago on facebook that you posted the the screenshot of when you were on saved by the bell yes uh, wondering what yes. your how you got that and everything uh, that was a, a stroke sort of of good luck because um i actually just went in to be an extra Oh, and um, they said, "Hey, you, <laughs> can you uh, just go?" And there's a there was a guest actress, and they wanted me to go and dance with her and talk to her, and then tell her I was going to get her a, a glass of punch, so that way Zach, the you know lead guy, mm -hmm. could come in and talk to her. So oh. basically, that's how I got got that, you know, which is crazy because I still get residual checks from from just doing that little bit. Mm -hmm. And what, what was your, uh, did you get to interact with everybody in the main cast too? Um, I mean, everyone was there because there was, it was a big sort of dance scene. And then there was also a big uh, basketball, mm. you know, scene happening. Um, but, you know, I mean, I really didn't get to formally hang out with those guys. <laughs> right. <laughs> Although my friend, a friend of mine, Kirsten Warren, ended up being one of the regulars on, um, when they did the college years, Saved oh. by the Bell, the college year. Yeah, she ended up being one of the regulars as a, as a new cast. I and, uh, <laughs> and I do uh, just want to generally ask to back then and early in your career, uh, were, did you ever get the opportunity to be a part of anything that was, um, that like went on to be iconic or like audition for it or anything like that? Um, I'm, tr yeah, I'm trying to think of, in the 80s, it was a little more difficult because, um, you know, it's really hard when you, when you just come out to LA and try right. to be an actor and try to get an agent and get your headshots and, and, you know, I had no connections, you know, I have mm -hmm. no one in the family, you know, and it's, it's, it is a city and that you really have to be connected sometimes, you know, um, it's, it's really, it's, it's, I think it's a hard city to be an actor anywhere. Anything you want to do in the creative industry, it's, it's not easy. And um, I actually stopped acting for a bit because uh, I just wanted to do something different. And uh, I ended up moving to Hong Kong. So I thought I, yeah, so I kind of just decided I was going to quit because I wasn't really happy with where the career was going. You know, I felt lucky to get the things I got you know, because some people never get cast in anything. Right. And, uh, you know, and I was doing tons of theater as well. Uh, a lot of educational films, industrial films, you know, any, any kind of gig I would take. Mm. Uh, and I love doing theater. I did a lot of plays in Los Angeles. I, I used to try to at least get one or two plays a year. And, um, but in 1990, I think it was around 91, I started thinking I wanted to try to do something different because I was kind of feeling in a rut as an actor. Right. It wasn't moving forward or moving ahead. And um, I ended up moving to Hong Kong. I got accepted by a, um, an organization that was like working with uh, Vietnamese refugees as well as orphans in China, that sort of thing. Wow. So I did some volunteer work then, yeah, and also got hired uh, to work with Caritas uh, in Vietnamese refugee camps in 92, 93. So I, I did that for about a year um, and came back to L.A. and did not act for about nine years. Wow. Uh, yeah, so I took a total break and never thought, I just thought, okay, I guess I'm done, you know, because uh, it's difficult. It's difficult to start again. 
And uh, so I was just doing different kinds of jobs, trying to figure out where I should go, what I should do next. And uh, I was working at a doctor's medical malpractice insurance company, very <laughs> corporate, you know, tie and all that stuff. And I hated it. <laughs> you know, I was like, what am I doing? Um, and I ran into an old friend of mine who uh, was an actor and um, he had seen me in this one play I had done back in the eighties. And he, he just looked at me, Oh, Daryl, you know, how's it going? Actually, he's, he's an actor on Westworld. Uh, oh. He's, yeah, he's one of the robots. I don't know what character he plays or the androids, whatever they call them. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's one of those guys. And um, his name is Lewis Hertham. Um, and so he saw me, he's Daryl, what are you doing? And I said, oh, no, not really acting. He goes, you got to go back to acting. And he said, let's, let's have coffee someday. And so we set up a, a, a time and I met him for coffee and he just said, Daryl, go back to acting. You're an actor. I remember seeing you in a play. You're, you're an actor. You have to do it. And I was like, oh, I can't. It's just too hard. And, uh, I, started taking an act, I started taking an acting class again. And it was kind of just there, you know? Um, and I realized I love being creative. Mm -hmm. So the job I was doing, I was not creative at all. It was just, it was just not me. Mm -hmm. and um, from there I decided I would try to start again and I was very fortunate because I uh, got an agent actually from a play I was doing because around 2000 I think it was I started auditioning again and I was doing a, I did a play I said I'll just do some local plays if I, if I can get in some theater or whatever and I was doing a play uh, called Up Cat Creek and another actress who was in the play her agent came to see the show and then at the end of the play, the agent told her that she wanted to meet me. So we set up a time and I met with her and she um, took me on as a client. And then that kind of started my acting again, for better or for worse. Right. And shortly after that, that's when you were in Wind Talkers. Right. I got Wind Talkers through her. Um, I also booked a national commercial uh, through her. And um, then unfortunately she went out of business <laughs> like a lot of young, smaller agencies do. It's, you know, sad. Um, and so then I was like, okay, now I have to find another agent type thing. And, you know, that's, that's the, the world of an actor sometimes. Mm -hmm. And what, what, what was your personal experience on Wind Talker since that's obviously a really, you know, intense action. Yeah, project. that was wonderful. Um, well, I went in for the audition and never thought I would get the part because they were, they had actually filmed the, the film. It was already done, hmm. but they, they were, they had filmed, they filmed in Hawaii. So they were going to film on two days or two or three days back in Los Angeles um, at this army base area in San Pedro. And they were adding some scenes to it. Okay. So they were hiring, you know, actors to come in and, and help do these scenes. And um, so I went, to audition and there were tons of guys, you know, so many, I mean, it was like almost like an open casting call, but you know, I went in through my agent and I just did it, had a good time and said, and let it go. And then I ended up booking the part of this uh, battleship petty officer. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it wasn't a real battleship. Of course, it was on a sound stage in, in this a Navy area or something. And um, John Wu was the director. Um, um, Nicholas Cage wasn't there because he wasn't in that scene, but uh, I did meet uh, Adam Beach, who um, who played uh, the, one of the code talkers because it's mm -hmm. about those who were doing these code talking in in the, in the war, and um, he really nice guy. Uh, and then John Wu um, was the director, so it was kind of cool because you know I lived in Hong Kong, and John Wu is from Hong Kong, the director was famous for his Hong Kong films first. And so uh, when I met him, I, I, I said, which is, do you speak some Cantonese? Okay. <laughs> so I speak a little, because I, I was like, you know, I speak and uh, um, he looked at me like, cause not expecting, you know, and of course I'm thinking, you know, if you ever need a, a, a guaylo, which is they call a white guy, uh, in one of your movies who can speak some Cantonese, here I am. But uh, <laughs> so that was kind of fun. It was a good experience. Mm -hmm. But when I went to see the movie, because I remember when they opened, 
you know, I, I went on, on the opening night because I never know if your scene is going to be cut mm -hmm. or not. You know? So I was just glad my scene was not cut. That's what I always think about. Am I going to be cut? <laughs> yeah. And I did want to ask, uh, to, uh, it was, was, uh, one of the reasons why you stopped acting in the nineties. Did you get kind of tired of being cast as teenagers or did that never really bother yeah, you? Yeah, I did. I oh. did. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was tired of it. And, and also I was, um, not kind of, I was wanting to, to kind of, you know, get to a different level. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't want to just be doing B movies my whole life. You know, I wanted to also be doing some things that I felt challenged me, you know, as an actor. And um, so it was, you know, it was hard because trying to get the roles you want. Um, and I, I mean, I auditioned for some big projects, you know, um, like a guest star on, on um, oh, what was that Johnny Depp TV show that got him famous? Oh, 21 Jump Street. Uh, what? 21 Jump, yeah, 20, 21 Jump Street, right. And I auditioned for this part as a guest star. Um, but the guy who got it was some kid from, I forget what show, he had been on a sitcom. So mm -hmm. he was already established. Um, I auditioned for a uh, Al Pacino movie you know, oh. for a lead. But it was Chris, o Chris O'Donnell, who already had experience, mm -hmm. got the role. Um, gosh, a lot of things. Cheers, I had a callback for a guest star in Cheers. Um, but you know, it was like, I could, it was almost like so close and then like nothing, you know? Mm -hmm. So it just got to the point where I was kind of tired of, I was thinking, well, maybe this is all it's meant to be, you know? So I just needed the break and actually I'm glad I did because I think, uh, you know, it changed how I see the business in a lot of ways. So I didn't take it as, as personal mm -hmm. when I didn't get roles, you know? And I think that was sort of a, more of a maturing process as an actor. So with the, yeah, with the Pacino movie you were just talking about was Scent of a Woman? Scent of a Woman, yes. Wow. Oh, that have been amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Is there, is there like a, is there a story that you have with that? That's, 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 that's really cool. No, I, I, I remember auditioning, but that's kind of really it. You know, Al Pacino mm. wasn't there, of course. Um, but I remember when the movie came out and I was like, Oh, that would have been awesome. You know? <laughs> um, and there were some really, there were some movies where I felt I was very close and then the movies didn't get made. Oh, mm -hmm. um, there was one called, I remember one called Ryder. It was R Y D E R. And Chris Christopherson was attached to it. And, uh, I auditioned for his son and they were really, seemed really excited, you know, like, oh yeah, you would be, you know, whatever. But then I just never heard anything and I never saw the movie made. Um, there was another one called Quarter Time that with Jeff Bridges attached, didn't wow. get made. Yeah, but it never got made. Um, and I'm trying to think, there was another, oh, and then, then there was a, a TV series called Frank's Place and they were going to, it took place in New Orleans. Now I'm originally from Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And they, they were going, it was, it was on CBS, and they were going to do a spinoff and do these Cajun characters. Oh. So I can do the, I can do the Cajun dialect, because I grew up in a Cajun family. Mm -hmm. So when I went in to the casting director, you know, they had the script written a certain way. And I said, well, can I improvise and do it like a Cajun would do it? And they were like, oh, yeah. So, of course, I did that. And, you know, I got really great response. And then I, then Frank's place was canceled and oh. they never did, the, they never did that episode. So there was a lot of that where you felt like, uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. So there was, there was a lot of that where it was like, uh, do I really want to keep doing this? Can I, will I ever get where I want to go? And so, but I'm glad I took the experience off. It was hard coming back. Trust me. Mm. Very difficult. Um, you know, because it's, it's not as easy when I'm talking about it, you know, because you have all these years of um, trying to get back on track or, um, I mean, even now, it's, it's still hard to, be, it's hard to be an actor, you know, yeah. I'm not, so, but now I can at least understand it and take it as it is. And uh, I know that your, your first anime role would have been the lead in Overman King Gainer, right? Well, yeah. 
I actually um, auditioned for that. And then through that, they gave me some smaller roles on um, the show called Stelvia. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I, yeah. And then also another guy, I think it was another company, put me some smaller roles on um, Cyborg 009. Yep. Um, so I, was, I did a few of those first. And I think th I was sort of being tested out in – then within a few months after I had originally auditioned for Overman King Gainer, I, I got the lead in that. So that was really my first lead role. Um, and then from there, I, I started doing a lot more, a lot more anime, which was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, take to it easily or was that difficult? No, I mean, I think I had a great director, uh, Tony Oliver. And yeah. I think that, it, you know, and he also teaches courses and workshops on voice acting and they knew I was pretty much a beginner so I think uh, you know having him as a director uh, really helped me a lot so but I yeah I think eventually as I got into several episodes I started really getting more of the hang of it you know then of course as more roles came uh, you know definitely but I, I, I love voicing anime it's a lot of fun mm -hmm. I think it's cool too that uh in Gainer that the female lead was Mari Devon too, because she's really underrated. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. <laughs> <laughs> I think that show was over, was underrated. Right. You know, I think it's popular in Japan, but not as much here. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you kind of, even though it was only for a couple episodes, you got to be kind of a bigger character on Samurai Champloo. Yeah, I love doing that one too. But it was a great role, you know. <laughs> that was an awesome part to be able to voice and such a great show. Hey, look, I'll do one word in any anime, you know. <laughs> and do you have a do you have a preference between um being a part of darker series or like lighter series? Um mm, I, I, I guess I like sort of the darker ones mm -hmm. a little more uh, because um, I love the arcs that these dark ones take you into. Right. You know, um, I like the surprises that they sort of throw at you. But I also like when there's humor in the darker ones. Mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah. And, of course, the lighter ones are, 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 are fun, too, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I tend to te tend to gravitate a little bit more to stuff like Paranoia Agent and yep. um, and you know Durara has that crazy mix of being very light at times and then very dark at times. Mm -hmm. You know, and when they cry, oh my god, you know, <laughs> that one's amazing. Hiragashi, you know. Yep, that was actually the first series that um, like made made me remember your voice. So. Uh nice yeah and um since that obviously is probably the most darkest thing that you've worked on is there a certain um process that you do to go in like the emotional place that satoshi was in yeah um well you know i usually just try to the good thing about anime is that you're you're going in sequential order yep so for me, when I'm into it, I'm already at that place where I'm hopefully feeling what the character is feeling because I know his story. And I think for me, as if I can just connect, you know, to this, here, I, here I look at this animated character on the screen that I, you know, because you have to match the lid flap so you see it, yep. you know, the character going through that. I just try to attach to the emotions that I see the character um, sh uh, showing and that sort of gets me in the place mm -hmm. I think so and is there definitely, a you know Satoshi has that huge dramatic scene and of course I don't want to give anything away if someone hasn't seen the show right um, yeah. you know and you have to get into that rage yeah you need to feel that rage when you're doing it so and just in general with anime too, is there anybody that any character that you can relate to the most that you've played? Yeah, um, I mean, 
you know, all of them have a little bit of element that I can um, attach to or to, I mean, Jurarara definitely, uh, Mikado. Um, I love sort of that he's got this shy exterior, but yet there's something deeper going on mm-hmm. within him that he doesn't necessarily always show. Yeah. Um, and I can, I can relate to that. <laughs> and maybe we all can to a certain degree, you know, what we're sometimes feeling on the inside, but have to project on the outside. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I liked him a lot. He was a lot of fun. And were, weren't you a central character on uh, Dear S? Too? On which, on which one? Dear S or Deers, however you say it. Oh, Deers, yeah, it's just, yeah, it's Deers. Uh, you, you know, I was just this crazy character. There was number one and number two. Yeah. <laughs> <Sounds> horrible. <laughs> uh, and I was number two. And uh, uh, he, he was this crazy character. The, they were like a little duo that would sort of just pop up in the episodes throughout. And they were kind of little, um, these little horny teenagers, right? <laughs> that <laughs> would get excited by certain things going on in the show. So they usually had a lot. I think Sam Regal was the other guy. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So they would just have these, a lot of crazy reactions to some of the scenes and things. So yeah, I wasn't one of the main characters, but they came in and out throughout the entire series. Okay. So kind of crazy. That's, that's your light stuff, right? <laughs> the, the, the fun kind of thing. <laughs> crazy stuff and in the mid 2000s too you got to be in that lisa kudrow tv series yeah i'm back that was great um you know and they have a we did a a photo shoot because we had to have a a fake tv guide cover oh that's (laughs) cool because i yeah so i wish i could get it you know what i mean i have it on my imdb page in my photos you can see myself and lisa kudrow on it and um, we were supposed to be, so the show was in the 90s or 2000, I can't remember when the show was, but um, my character was basically her co-star from a fictional 80s TV show yep. that we were supposed to be actors in. Mm-hmm. And I was um, a Michael J. Fox type. Oh, yeah. Is, is the prototype, you know, for that character. And then... Also, they called us back. They called me back in and two other actors because we did a cast shoot of the fake show. And the other two actors were supposed to be, one was like a, a Benson type, you know, Robert Guillaume. And the other actress was like a Lonnie Anderson type from the TV show WKRP in Cincinnati. Right. So, so they were kind of using 80s type icon, iconic characters to be her co-stars. Mm, that's cool. Yeah, so she was really nice. And the guy who actually uh, created that series also created uh, Sex in the City. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then you were in Alias, too, at the same time? Yeah, yeah around the same time. Um, I was a hotel desk, a Flemish hotel desk clerk. <laughs> uh, so I had to do a Belgian accent, it's supposed to be Flemish. So I... Never thought I was going to get that. And um, so, but it was a lot of fun. So I did that. I had one episode and we filmed at the um, Biltmore in downtown Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I had a scene with uh, Jennifer Garner and also uh, met Carl Lumley, who was one of the actors on the show. But the terrible thing about that show, I just had this one part. Yep. And they were filming on location all day. And so they were running behind schedule. And when they got to our scene was going to be the very last scene they were filming. And the director came up to me and he said, you know, we're, we're running behind. So unfortunately we're only going to be able to film from behind you and from a long shot, you know, in the hotel lobby. And he said, but you know, if we're not able to see you, maybe we'll get to use you for a different episode, which usually doesn't happen. Yeah. But, uh, and it didn't happen. But uh, so I'm thinking to myself, well, maybe they'll see me in the long shot at least, you know, mm-hmm. but they have these at the Biltmore, they have these huge columns that just like go around. So you can't even see the person at the front desk other than the customer, which, you know, Jennifer Gardner was, was playing. Um, so you get to see this ear and a little bit of my head and you hear my accent and that's it. 
Oh. <laughs> yeah. So this year is famous, but uh, you know, but I was like, hey, I still got my credit. You still hear me. And in that same time, in the mid two thousands or like late two thousands, were you auditioning for a lot of those major TV series too? Uh, I'm trying to think now. Uh, there were some. You know what my thing is now is I kind of just let everything go. Mm. You know, I you know I audition for for things, and if I don't get it, I don't get it, um, and I kind of just kind of move on. I mean, I auditioned for Hollywood late recently, which was the show that played on Netflix um, before the pandemic. Yep. Um, I had auditioned for. They called me in three times, but I never booked it. But uh, but I was like, okay, good. They called me in three times. I always look at it sort of. It's as long as I'm getting out there and they're seeing me, you never know where it's going to lead mm -hmm. right. or what other show I might, they might call me in on, you know, the casting director. So. Mm -hmm. And back to anime, um, you got to be a lead in another underrated action show, uh, Busa Rankin. Yes. I, that one, that one was great too. Um, yeah, that is another one I think that needs, that's, that's a little underrated. Um, I'm trying to remember the, who did I play in that? Was that the uh, researcher? Oh, that was a, uh, that was a uh, gun sword. Oh, right, 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 right. Okay. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm getting them confused now. <laughs> so I, you know, I have my IMDB page here too, so I can remember. Okay. That was, um, that was Koji. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? That's the one where I play um, one of the Dalton brothers, right? No, that's Code Geass. Yeah. Why can't I remember? Okay. Why can't I remember Busu Rankin? Ko oh, that was Koji. Yeah, Koji Rakamasu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's the one. You know why that one was so weird? Because there were, my character, he, he's the one that, couldn't he imitate other yeah. characters? Yeah. That's why I have a hard time remembering that because right. <laughs> because a lot of other the actor I was imitating was voicing my character. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. That was weird. <laughs> so it's only me when I'm doing me, and then it's him when when I'm doing him. But it's him. Yeah, confusing. My dog's like, "What are you doing?" I'm sorry, I just got it. What Daisy? That's cute. So anyway. <laughs> That's why I keep looking down if somebody's wondering. And you yeah, got that was a, that was a strange show. Yep. And also another kind of light romantic comedy series. Uh, I think it's called, I think you pronounce it Eyes. I love doing Eyes. Yep. Um, yeah, that was a lot of fun, actually. That was one of the lighter ones, too. That, But I really enjoyed doing that one because... Um, you know, the character kind of was like a Mikado, but not as, not as shy, mm -hmm. but definitely more kind of bumbling, I guess, a little awkward, you know, trying to find his way with relationships, you know, with girlfriends and mm -hmm. relating to these, this girl he really likes and uh, that sort of thing. So he was fun to do. I'm not and sure. that, but it's another, one, it's another one that I don't think gets seen a lot either oh, yeah yeah and you know you got to play several different characters on bleach yes um i think i did episode six and then two six seven eight or something like you know in the beginning yeah and then like two, two years later i got a call and and they were uh you know that character you played in episode eight well he's back in episode 222 or whatever it was Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was, what? <laughs> who, who did I voice? That was strange, having to go back to a character that I voiced two years earlier, but I couldn't really remember how I voiced him. Right. So they, you know, thank goodness they pull back, they pull the uh, tape of, uh, of what you did so you can kind of get back into that frame of, of thought and get your voice to the right pitch. Mm -hmm. And... Um... I was really big into the Dynasty and Samurai Warriors games. I know that you were multiple characters yeah. in both of those. And I've talked to um, I've talked to Julie Madalena and Terrence Stone, and they said that 
they were um, one of the directions was that they couldn't really emote as much because they wanted it they wanted to they wanted it to sound like how it was way way back then is that the same thing that you were told to yes absolutely because <laughs> you know, i do see a lot of a lot of criticism you know with the like why do they sound so stilted or yeah you know <laughs> you know <laughs> and um if you look at especially when i did well, uh, when I, I remember when I did actually one of my favorite characters was the last one that the, um, oh, what, what was it? Dynasty Wars 8? Um, you know, and the characters speak very slow mm -hmm. because, you know, we're still also matching the lip flaps. So you might be saying a line and your line is, um, I admire you, Lord Sensei. Yeah. You know, because the lips are doing that too. And <laughs> they want you to not really emote too much. You know, so. Do you get um, physical in the booth too when it comes to doing things like that? Oh, yeah. Especially those, the, the uh, call outs, you know, when you're doing the, the fights, because you have to do multiple. You right. know, so it helps you kind of get in that mode of receiving. Um, hits or, or, you know, giving it out, you know, as well, because you have to do light, heavy, medium, you know, different stages of it. So you're doing all sorts of things and yeah, it helps, definitely helps, but I, it's really hard on the, on the voice because you're doing, especially with Dynasty Warriors, you're doing so many fights yep. and, and usually you'll do the cut scenes first, the, the dialogue and then you go back and they'll record the fight scenes uh, after because you usually you know, lose your voice and <laughs> leave the booth not being able to speak you know, for, for a bit. Your voice is so rough you know, from doing it. And do you really have an attachment with the characters that you played in both those games or is it more just remembering that you had to do all that kind of stuff? No, um, I definitely feel mostly attached to the last one I did. Oh. Um, cause actually, um, he was the one that was, I think most that they allowed me to, uh, have more emotion. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, his, uh, shoo shoo. Yep. And cause he had some actually very dramatic type moments cause he feels a lot of sort of, uh, self recrimination, a lot of shame about himself so that was kind of a nice uh change you know to do something like that i mean still you know low-key but i got to emote definitely more with him i mean i love doing tai chi chi as well he was another one i think i'm probably connected to those two the most mm -hmm. and i know that you were a uh, masamune in uh like three of the samurai warriors games too Yes. Yeah. And that was, I don't remember that one as much. I don't know if I did as much with him as okay. I did I see and, and Shushu. Because even in eight, I was um, uh, Yujin, which, and, but Yujin as well was a smaller uh, role. Mm -hmm. uh, Shushu tended to be a, a larger, had more cutscenes. So I, you know, it's easier to get attached to that. Mm -hmm. And is that uh, probably in terms of video games, is that um, like the, I don't know, most fun that you've had or is there something else? Actually, I think the most fun has been, was, um, was Beautiful Joe. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. In uh, Mar yeah, Marvel vs. Capcom. Um, Cause you know, he's just such a wild character. Um, you know, didn't think I'd get cast in anything like that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but he was a lot of fun. You know, he's, he's a great character. Yeah, and obviously that's, a, um, that's an iconic um, character yeah. too. And uh, did you approach it any differently than you normally would? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, the, little, there was a little bit of pressure because, uh, what is it, D.D. Bradley Baker, D. Bradley Baker, mm -hmm. um, I believe did the original yep. uh, video game. And then there was another actor who had done the series. So, you know, when you're trying to do something, everyone, you know, loved what D. Bradley especially did. Yep. So it's, you know, you know you're going to get some 
push back, be, you know, because you're coming in and doing this part. Um, but I didn't try to, I, tr I listened to his work, of course, and I, I didn't try to imitate because I'm, I'm not him. Yep. Um, so when we were working on it, they wanted me to sort of keep the same tone, I guess, but also uh, the same attitude that Joe has, but also kind of go off the Japanese version more. Yep. So when I was doing it, of course, you, I would hear the Japanese version and try and work it all into that. Mm -hmm. But he was fun because too, you know, I got to also just do some crazy noises and sounds and, you right. know, <laughs> they actually used some sounds that I, I was kind of surprised, you know, that, that uh, you know, I was just experimenting at times, mm -hmm. you know, because they want t different takes on, on a fight or a punch or whatever. And so you're doing multiple ones. And then every now and then I just try to throw in something a little weird just to, because you never know. And yeah. uh, every now and then I would hear it and I'm like, oh, okay, they picked that. And in regards to, um, since you were in Valkyrie Profile too, um, yes. and that's obviously like a really olden setting, was that similar in, like in regards to Dynasty and Samurai Warriors? Yeah. Yeah, it was similar because you you are definitely more low key, um, diff definitely deeper voice than uh, beautiful Joe, um, and and he had more. He also had a British, you know, not quite full British, but they want a little bit of that sort of British feel, mm -hmm. you know, uh, old way of speaking. So, but Is Lael it? was a lot of fun too from um, Crystal Chronicles. Oh, Final Fantasy, yeah. Yeah, that was, that was fun because he was as well sort of a, just a different role, you know, for me to, to, to voice. Mm. And, with, and I loved him, I, I just could say I loved him because he was definitely an anti-hero, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. And with, in, with uh, accents, is um, that also something that's easier for you to slip into at this point, or is there one that's, like, more difficult than others? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's some I can do. I kind of have to be in the right frame of mind. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, I, yeah, it just, a Scottish is hardest for me, but every now and then I feel like I get it, but mm. I find Scott do, doing a Scottish accent is not as easy. Um, with practice, I'm better at, at, at German. Uh, I've done some ger roles where I had to have German accent. Mm. Um, Irish as well, um, you know, things like that. Uh, and even some, you know, Flemish, I had to do this French, yep. Belgian, German mixture for Alias. Um, I mean, I like doing accents, actually. I like trying to practice with it, you know. And I like doing funny accents, too. <laughs> you know, where it's, it's just something that you can just go all crazy, crazy with. So, but yeah, I think it, it, I need to concentrate and just focus on that character. Uh, and the way of speaking. And I, I have hired um, vocal coaches before, especially when I did the guy who was German, because he was also a real life character. So mm -hmm. I wanted to get that right. Um, and he spoke a little bit of German in the film. But um, yeah, and I'll listen, I try to go and listen to accents on certain movies where I know there's authentic sounding, you know, characters. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not good if somebody just says, hey, do an accent. <laughs> and then I'm just like, well, you know, I need the lines to put it on. So. Right. Yeah. I thought it was funny that I did notice that you were on that reality show that Gene Simmons had. That was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and I tell you, look, it's these reality shows, people, they're not real. They make them up. They mm -hmm. like, you know. Uh, yeah, because I, I auditioned to play a fictional character in a reality show. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so and I did meet him, so that was kind of cool. I met Gene Simmons. Yeah. Was it, there's a guy from Kiss. Yeah. Was it like a pleasant experience? Oh yeah. It was yeah, it was it was it was fun. I mean it was it was all improv. I mean there was no lines, so you kind of just imp improvising, so that was kind of fun. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, basically I'm this guy that I'm supposed to be this clothing store buyer from New York that his assistant is picking up at the airport. Mm -hmm. But instead of taking me straight to this clothing store opening, 
they, um, he picks me up and has all these beautiful women in a limousine. And we drive around, go around LA <laughs> to give me a good time. <laughs> but we filmed it out of sequence, which is funny. But the real part of the show was that there really was a clothing store opening. Mm -hmm. So there were really were like, like paparazzi, you know, taking pictures of celebrities. And then when we drove up, you know, because I'm in this car <laughs> with these beautiful women, just like me, the assistant, and like, I don't even remember how many girls, like eight maybe. And so I remember the paparazzi <laughs> were looking in, oh my God, who's that? You know, looking in the the limousine, like they thought somebody important was in there, mm -hmm. you know? And then, you know, we, we come out like, and they kind of like, who's that? You know, and, and I'm just thinking to myself, don't worry, it's nobody, it's nobody. So that was just so strange. Right. You know? And then we had to, improv, uh, I had to improvise meeting Gene Simmons, like our first meeting. Mm -hmm. And they kind of tell you what to say, but you just kind of go off of that. And then they say, hey, let's do it again, just to make sure we have it. So. You know, usually in reality, you don't get a second chance to mm -hmm. like reintroduce yourself or something. So, but yeah, it was, it was a great experience. I, I ended up getting a swag bag and get paid mm -hmm. and ride around in a limo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and one anime that you had a lead role in that um, I think is really cool and it's also underrated is the um, Nura. Which one? Nura. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, because I feel the same. That was great. It was so fun doing him. Um, yeah, I like. I think that show is just crazy. And with all the uh, yokai and, mm -hmm. you know, very creative. Um, so the artwork is gorgeous on it, you know, with the cherry blossom. Definitely. Um, yeah, so that was a lot of fun to do. And... Um, my only wish was that in the second uh, series, se season of it, there was less of my character, you know, because I was, my character was transforming more into his other self. Yeah. You know, so it would have been fun to sort of be involved a little bit more because that was a sort of a darker, that show was definitely darker. The animation even changed. Mm -hmm. uh, but it kind of makes sense because, you know, the first uh, season of it it was more based on my character and his coming to terms with who he is yep. so the animation the animation fit his style you know and then I think the second season as I was changing more into the other character and um, the animation I think fit that character mm -hmm. so that was a lot of fun do you remember what your um, process was of kind of altering the nuance of how he developed like that? Um, well, I, I didn't voice, of course, the second, the older character. Yeah. Um, uh, but I, I don't really remember. I remember, um, I think it was just feeling that emotion of what it would be like, you know, to like, oh, who am I really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and, and, and there's this part of yourself maybe that you don't want to accept um, and just sort of coming to terms with that and, and trying to also be a normal kid at the same time, wanting to live like a normal life. Yeah. And this gets in the way, you know, um, but that's, that's pretty much how I took it emotionally, I guess, um, with the whole transformation. And finally, once he's able to Except, you know, who he is and, and take hold of it. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a fun show. If, you have, if anyone hasn't seen it, it's, it's definitely worth watching. Now, I think, I don't know if you know, but I think the only season is the second season available on Netflix, which is weird if you don't get the first season. Right, I don't know why they did that. Yeah, so very strange. I know... Um... Obviously, like, Blue Exorcist isn't set back then, but it's dealing with, you know, yokai and kind of all that same stuff, and your character, yeah. I'm on, is really fun, too. Yeah, he was great. He's another one I, I, I actually love voicing, um, because he's like a, a child demon, you know? He doesn't mm -hmm. know, he doesn't have any moral 
register of what's good, what's bad. For him, it's just he is who he is, and he does it, and there's no sense of, you know, emotion to it, which is fun, <laughs> you know. It's, it's, he, and he has a temper, you know, he has these temper tantrums, which were, were fun to do. Um, loves to create trouble and havoc, and doesn't, but in his, I think in his way, he doesn't realize it's trouble and havoc. It's just, it's all the game, right? you know, to him. So I love that. What, Daisy? What? Oh, my goodness. Sorry. <laughs> He's feeling left out. When you get your own anime series, you can do an interview. <laughs> <laughs> what were your thoughts on, because um, I know you got to be a big character in um, Mad Guy, too, Ren? Yeah, yeah. He's another one. I mean, you know, I feel fortunate because a lot of these characters I just feel like were so multi-dimensional and different from each other as well. Um, and I, and I got to play around with doing different voices, you know, different types of voices. Yeah. Um, so he, I, I loved him because he also dealt with, I mean, those family issues that he had were just pretty intense. And, um, uh, I think some of my favorite scenes to voice were, um, the scenes where he's expressing his love. Well, I forget, what's the character's name? The girl? Oh, like Christina V. Yeah, uh, yeah. Morgiana. Yeah. That uh, Christina V, who did a great job of uh, voice. I love the scene where he's kind of, where he's pouring his heart out to her, you know? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, <laughs> slammed in the face. Uh, <laughs> and also, when he finally gets home, the the ama amount, the, just the amazing scenes about with his mother and, and remembering things about his family. Mm -hmm. you know, those were just great. Um, and I love that he came back at the very end and I feel like, okay, why is this unresolved? There needs to be more episodes of this. Right. <laughs> um, but of course, I, I'm going to say that because I always want to work. And just uh, generally too, are, is there um, certain other anime dub people that you're close with? Um, I mean, it's been a while. I mean, especially because of the pandemic, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I haven't really been doing much or seeing many people. Um, Kyle Abear is a great guy. Um, you know, I, I, I love when I am able to hang out with him or see him, and, you know, I mean, a lot of times, mostly when I see people, it's usually been, um, at conventions, whenever, yep. you know, that's really the, the easiest time we have to hang out. Um, but of course, now the convention scene is kind of slowed down. So hopefully that'll start up again. Um, I mean, I love um, Stephanie um, Young. Is it Young? Because I know her as Stephanie Brim. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Cause she, and, uh, you know, she, but she's based in Texas. She and her husband, I, when I've seen them at conventions, I love hanging out with them. Um, yeah, it's just, whoever's there, I just, whoever wants to have, you know, hang out and have a good time, I'm, it's always fun. Mm -hmm. Definitely when you get voice actors together, it's, you know, <laughs> it's really crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've been trying to make a goal of interviewing other people that have never been interviewed like um i got in touch with bridget hoffman yeah and she's never been surprisingly really yeah <laughs> That's weird and like kirk uh kirk thornton too he hasn't been either and kirk kirk is another great guy uh bryce i love when he's at conventions as well mm -hmm. bryce Patton, so. And I can, because uh, I've talked to several other people that were on Code Chaos, so um, what were your thoughts on the role in that series? Um, my character was one of the Dalton brothers, and yeah. um, I was excited, actually, when I first was, was going to be able to voice something on that show. And I knew about the show, and I knew, um, you know, they were already voicing it, so I didn't think I was involved. And uh, so I got this guy, Alfred Dalton, and I think it's towards the end of the first season. Mm-hmm. And I was excited, you know, and then, um, and I think, I can't remember now if, it, if he starts up again in the f beginning of the second season. Because I'm not sure when my, I'm just going to say it, I can't remember when my character dies. 
<laughs> <laughs> because it was either the very end of the first season or very beginning of the second, because I finally get this part on Code Geass, and he's in a fighter jet, whatever it is they're fighting in, those machines. Yep. And, and all of a sudden, he blows up. Mm -hmm. And I was like, are you kidding me? I finally get a part in this, and he blows up that quick. You know, because I wanted to keep going, you know. Um, so I was like, okay, he survived, right? You know, I kept trying to figure out, okay, maybe he parachuted out. We didn't see. But no, didn't happen. There is something I haven't um, asked anybody yet that uh, what is the um, difficulty or yeah, um, involving death scenes? Oh, see, I think in the. Oh, uh, like difficulty involving death scenes, recording that and stuff? Well, yeah. Well, you know, it sort of depends on what the death scene is. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Dynasty Warriors, <laughs> like if you're doing the video game, let's say. Um, you know, those are crazy just because you want to try to be as authentic as you can, but you're doing it multiple times mm -hmm. because you might die different ways. You know, so that's, that's just, that's a whole different thing. But, um, I mean, death scenes in other shows, it just sort of depends how you're going to die too. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I did one, I actually did this film actually that Yuri Lowenthal was involved in. Uh, is the something princess. <laughs> I can't remember. It was something. Oh, the Swan princess. Oh, royal, the Swan princess, a Royal family. Uh, tale, um, fairy tale, something like that. And my character was at the very beginning. Now, first of all, I went in and, and I auditioned and the whole scene was this father uh, who dies in the beginning. So mm -hmm. he has a death scene with Yuri's character because they end up taking my daughter and I'm sort of, you know, like, <laughs> I'm dying type thing. And, <laughs> but I'm, I'm basically telling him to take care of my daughter, right? So I auditioned for it and I did it. And then I don't remember how long ago it was. Then maybe two year, a year to two years, I get a call or an email from them saying, Oh, you forgot to sign your paperwork for the movie. I'm like, what? I was, I wasn't in the movie. And so I call them and they're like, Oh, we just used your audition. Okay, I'm glad you remembered to tell me. So I didn't even work. I mean, I worked on it, but in the audition. So oh. they just, they used my audition for the death scene for this character, which was great. You know, I thought, okay, cool. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, that was interesting. And then, um, I mean, there's also a lot of near deaths that you kind of go through as anime characters. Mm -hmm. um, you just, have, you know, I try to do it so it's just not so cheesy. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> So, you know, you know, you just don't want a cheesy death unless it's meant to be a cheesy death. And going off of that, uh, regarding what Satoshi does in Higurashi, was that like a really draining emotional well, process to get into? It is draining. Emotionally, I do get drained when I do very uh, emotional roles, you know, whether it's a breakdown or a uh, violent rage, you know? Yeah. Um, those are so fun to do. I just don't know why they're fun to do, but I love doing those. Um, they're just, I don't know, I don't know what else to say, but yeah, I'm usually physically or emotionally exhausted after that because you, you feel, at least I do, I, I kind of take on that pain they're going through that, sadness or that overwhelming uh fear or the the rage you know um i mean when you're done you're done of course but you know you do feel like oh wow i i, I spent this energy you know i spent all this emotional energy as well because sometimes it, you you might be more emotionally drained than physically drained right you know? it does do both but there is sort of this you're like oh my gosh i'm just exhausted from feeling that you know I know one of the more like more recent anime that you were in was Blame. Oh, which one? Blame? Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I wanted to do more on that, but uh, that was a that was you know that was fun to do. Uh, it's a, I, I, a great movie, you know. So he was more of a soldier, I think. Guy, I, I can't remember a lot of it because it didn't have a huge, huge, you know, part in it. So mm -hmm. I think probably a lot of extra running and fighting and things. <laughs> and I, uh, I, I remember back when the movie came out that I saw you post a lot about being in LBJ. So I'm sure that was a really yeah cool, that, cool story and everything. That was an amazing. Um, if I talk too much, let me know. But that was an amazing, amazing experience because uh, I auditioned for the role of Jack Valenti, who's a real person. Yep. And, um, you know, I, I went online and I listened to how he spoke because I had to do a little bit of an accent as well because he was originally from Houston. So I had to um, do a few things. That, uh, and actually, it was kind of funny because how, how I knew to do one word specifically because I had a line about President Kennedy. So I just knew to say President Kennedy, not Kennedy. Yeah. So I knew to say Kennedy and certain little things. So I went and I auditioned. Um, then maybe at the end of the week, I got a, uh, a message from my agent saying I had received a call back. And I went, okay, good. That's great. I, you know, at least I didn't screw up the first audition. And uh, so I went to the call back and then I'm in the waiting room. And as they opened the door for different actors, and I could see too, there were other characters because uh, they had women kind of dressed like Jackie Kennedy. Oh yeah. You know? So like Jackie was there and, and other, other characters. And we're all in suits, you know, cause it takes place in the 1960s trying to look that, that vibe. And then when they would open the door, they would introduce the actor going in. And I would, I heard this voice and it would say, hi, so-and-so, how you doing? And I was like, oh my God, that's Rob Reiner. Yeah, <laughs> you know his voice. You can tell his voice, and I kind of like oh, you know it adds a little more pressure. Mm -hmm. I knew he was directing the movie, and I thought, oh my god, Rob Reiner's in there. I said, okay, don't screw up. <laughs> <laughs> so then they call me in, and, and he says, "Hi, Daryl, how you doing?" And then he looked at me, and he said, "You look just like him. He looks just like him." And you know what do you say? You know, like the character. Yeah. The real life character. And uh, so, oh, I said, well, I hope that's a good thing. And then I did the, the dialogue and everything. You, you know, that was really good. I liked how you said um, President Kennedy and not President Kennedy, because he used to always say President Kennedy because he knew him in real life mm -hmm. because he had also become president of the Motion Picture Arts Association. So yep. Rob Reiner, being a Hollywood kid, knew this guy. Um, so I was like, oh, well, that's a good thing to know and it was very 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 nice probably one of the nicest people i've ever auditioned for mm -hmm. you know and he was just like, oh we're gonna film in new orleans and he was telling me all this stuff and i said well you know good that's great and you know he said nice to meet you blah 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 and i left and i was like wow you know okay that was great and i i think it was around maybe april or something where i, I auditioned because it wasn't going to film until the end of the year mm -hmm. i wasn't even expecting anything from it Mm -hmm. And then I was, I went to the gym right after and I was driving home. I had, um, and then I get a call on my phone, my cell phone. And I don't usually don't answer if I don't know who it is, if I don't see a name or something, but it was a two, one, three area code, which was like where we auditioned. So I just, well, I better pick it up. So I did. And it was the casting director. I mean, literally within three hours, they told me I got the role mm -hmm. and I was like, I mean, I was shocked because it usually doesn't happen that fast. Right. And so I just remember him telling me, hi, Daryl, this is so-and-so from the casting. And, you know, like to, it was a Friday. They said, we'd like to just let you know before the weekend, uh, we'd like you for the role of Jack Valenny. And we'll be contacting your agent, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden I just heard, you know, wah, 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 because I couldn't believe I was hearing that. And then he said, okay, I'll be contacting your agent. I hung up and then I, kind of stopped a minute, you know, I was driving and I thought, oh my God, I just hallucinated that they called me and I got the role. I, I just totally hallucinated this. Yeah. I was thinking maybe I worked out because I just got back from the gym. I wasn't hydrated, you know, something. So, <laughs> and I looked back at my phone, wait a minute, someone did call me from a 213. So maybe I didn't hallucinate, you know, but it really took me months and months and months before I actually believed it. Mm -hmm. Because 
things can happen where they decide to recast or the project gets delayed or they write out your scene or, or whatever. So I never believe anything until I'm actually like there. Mm -hmm. So once they got me my plane ticket and I was actually going, okay. And then um, I filmed in New Orleans for about a month. And, uh, you know, it was amazing because I got to meet and, and work with Woody Harrelson and um, Jennifer Jason Lee and, you know, I'm going to name drop <laughs> and Bill Pullman and right. uh, Richard Jenkins, you know, I mean, it was just, just an amazing experience, you know, and then I got home and I was like, oh, wow, that was, I hope that happens again. So we'll see if it does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. Yeah. So it was, a, you know, as an actor, it's like that, that was the height for me. Mm -hmm. Another another more recent uh, thing that you did video game. Um, I think you were multiple characters in Shen Shenmue Three. Yeah, I think it was like two or three. Yep. Characters. I wasn't really familiar with the first game. I didn't know the whole story around you know the, the first one. So um, or the, you know the first or second, because I forget how many years it was in between two and three. Like a long time. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was fun because I, I just got to kind of do two different kinds of characters, and um, but yeah, it was kind of cool being part of that one too. That that was really my last major video game that that, that I voiced, um, and of course the pandemics happened, and I, I haven't. I've only recorded a few little things because I don't really have a studio at home. You know, I have a good setup for mostly auditioning, you know, or maybe doing some narration, but um, so. So hopefully things open up again and hopefully I'll be out there again. Mm -hmm. If not, I'll, I guess I'll just move back to Hong Kong and do work there. <laughs> <laughs> and would, would the last anime that you worked on be Blame or was it something else? Wait, say that again? With the last anime? Oh, you mean the... Yeah, I, you know, I'm always bad with the name of that one, so I'm going to look that one up. Oh, Ishida and Asakura. Yeah. Um, and it's great because, you know, uh, I'm friends with um, Worky. Uh, St I always call him Worky, but Steven Nunez, who's uh, also was part of that, that. And he kind of got me looped into it, which was cool. I just, again, had a kind of small little role in that. But it was just nice to do something, you know, for a while and just be able to do it from home. And, and they gave me some direction and just sent in different uh, takes on, on what I was doing. And, you know, did it. Direct, sent a director. They were happy. So, you know, and I love working with those guys. I guess, uh, would your like single favorite anime role would be? Would it be Mikado or would it be somebody else? Um, that, it, that's hard to say. Single favorite, but I guess if I if I had to, it probably it would probably be Mikado because I think he's he had the um, biggest character arc. You mm -hmm. know that I've played a character who started at a certain point and went through a huge just three hundred and sixty and kind of back almost to where he started in a way mm -hmm. that grew from that experience. So he's, he was a great character to, to voice. I guess the last thing I can ask you is just, I like to end every um, interview I do with actors and asking what you would want your legacy to be. My legacy. Wow. I've never thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, I, I, I don't know if I feel like I need to leave a legacy other than that. I just hope that whoever's watched or listened to anything I've ever done, you know, even if it's something small that meant to them or something larger that I've done, um, that I guess what I like is when people come up to me and they've appreciated, you know, one of the roles or something, um, you know, because it's weird, you, you'll get responses that you never expect, like, oh, this, you, this character or something helped me get through a difficult time. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, that's happened to me where people have come up and told me those things. Or, um, so I guess, I guess that's just it. It's just if there's something that's just resonated with someone, you know. I will tell you one quick thing was I was – in this is a very weird thing i was in malaysia and this kid came up to me 
um, and his mother. And, but he was an Australian kid who was living in Malaysia. His dad was working there. Mm. And it, was, it was at an anime convention. And I was a guest there. And he came up to me and he goes, you look familiar. Well, I, can't, I can't do the Australian accent right now. But <laughs> he, he had his Australian accent. He looked at me and he goes, you look really familiar. You, you look really familiar. What have you been in? Or what? So, well, you know, I was trying to think what he would have seen me because I'm mostly voiceover. Um, then I, I mentioned I was in that show on Nickelodeon Victorious. Oh, yeah. and, you know, I had a smaller role, but, uh, you know, a fun little crazy role. That was a lot of fun to do. I was uh, a lawyer to the main character, Victoria Justice, in this crazy little country. And I said, well, I said, well, Victorious, because, you know, he was kind of that age. And then he looked at me, he goes, you were that lawyer. You were that lawyer. <laughs> and he said, that was great. <laughs> I was just like, you know, it was just kind of shocking that mm -hmm. Someone in Australia, this kid, I met this kid from Australia in Malaysia that knew me mostly from anime, but remembered my character from Victorious. Yeah, that's cool. You know, so things like that are fun. Just to know that some, it's, something's resonated or it entertained someone or it meant something to someone, you know, you never know what you do, how it's going to, uh, you know, resonate with someone. Right. Well, thanks. It was cool to get to talk to you about stuff that, I hadn't seen you be asked before. <laughs> yeah, you know, you did. You did, definitely. Because, you know, mostly people are st stick with the anime. You know, a few, few times they will bring in the other things or, you know, sort of how it all started. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate it. Yeah, I just think it's especially cool um, seeing, you know, people that are primarily anime voice actors that I've done, like, major on-camera stuff starting from back then. Yeah, I mean, look at look, someone like Bo Billingsley. Right. <laughs> you know, I love that he was in, you know, Star Trek, yep. you know, one of the Star Trek movies, you know. So, I mean, I love it when I see actors that I've worked, voice actors I've worked with, you know, if I see them in something, you know, totally different. I think that's so cool. Mm. And for, for, uh, for Bridget being like the poster girl for the Evil Dead movie, too, oh, it's like yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. But, you know, like, like you just quickly, you talked about, um, some of the older things like where I've been at conventions where people have brought me uh, DVD covers of Silent Night, Deadly Night, of, um, right. <laughs> of Lauderdale, of Wind Talkers. And, you know, they have me sign the anime things and then they'll, oh, and can you sign Wind Talkers? <laughs> you know, can you sign Silent Night, Deadly Night? I'm like, oh my gosh, you know that too. So <laughs> yeah. that's all fun. I'll be sure to, once I have it up on YouTube, I'll send you the link. Very good. It was a pleasure meeting you, Chris. Thanks for taking time to talk to me. Yeah, you too.